together here in the house of the Lord, but that is not possible now. But God has promised to be present wherever we are, so we welcome you to this virtual service of worship here at Highway Avenue Mennonite Church. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. We'll begin with some announcements. If you have your bulletins, make sure you read all the announcements there. A reminder for the youth that snacks and scripture will meet this Sunday at 7 o'clock at the Hess home. Also remember to bring, remember to send or bring your offerings to the church on a regular basis. We need your continued support. In the bulletin there are links to the Highway Bird stories and photos and also the uh, Hive of Creativity. So check those out online you'll find them interesting. Next Sunday, uh, there will be another parking lot hymn sing. We'll have a regular uh, worship service recorded on Saturday. Susanna Larry, the new professor at the seminary, will be preaching. And then uh, on Sunday morning at 9.30, we'll have a hymn sing in the parking lot, and uh, the Zoom fellowship hour will then follow at 11.15. Then the following Sunday, on uh, July 26th, Hively and uh, three other Elkhart Benite churches are planning a combined Zoom worship service. So you'll want to uh, remember that. Listen to these words from Psalm 103 as our call to worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, 
who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Please pray with me. Merciful God, we long to experience you in our worship today. Despite our inability to gather together in this place, we come together to seek your blessing and acknowledge your presence in our lives and your abiding love and care for us. Grant us a measure of your abundant goodness and mercy. Thank you that we have the technology to communicate in this way. Grant us patience and flexibility as we deal with the pandemic that plagues our world today. Be with all who suffer illness and all who care for them. Restore us to health and wholeness. Show us your mercy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Today we continue our theme on Consider the Birds with our focus on the quail that God provided the children of Israel in the desert and how God provides for us. Our first two hymns reflect this theme. Uh, Walter will lead us. The prelude took me to Fiddlers on, on the Roof and the long tradition of speaking and singing and dancing uh, before Jehovah. And the dryness might have ended temporarily last night for us here in this desert, but in terms of the overall picture, we are in a desert still needing Jehovah to guide us. So this is an old song, even the music is only 200 years old, but the, the guide me stuff is very ancient and very modern. Please join me. Thank you. 
for the Peace Candle this morning, and I wanted to reflect on something that I read not too long ago in the New York Times. Um, it's been easy for me, I feel like, over the last, well, many years, but especially during this COVID era and this season of uh, social unrest and much going on in our nation, to get a little bit pessimistic. Um, so you feel like everyone is talking past one another, um, that no one is actually uh, hearing each other. But then I read this story about a man named Greg Reese. The story begins telling us that uh, Greg Reese, one washing his truck one day, peeled off the Confederate flag magnet from his truck for the last time. He said that he used to think of this, this image, this Confederate flag, as a, a beautiful trophy. This was the message that he had grown up with, but now he had come to see it as a symbol of hate. And from that, he wanted to start his own sort of brand or uh, decal, and so he created a Rednecks for Black Lives decal to put on his truck. But what's really interesting is what changed his mind. This is what he recounts. He says, the one thing that flipped me and made me really want to do something was when that baby, he's referring to uh, George Floyd's daughter, his six-year-old daughter, Gianna, was when that baby said that her daddy changed the world. He says, and I want to make that true. I want that baby's words to come true. It's hard not to see Jesus at work in the midst of that little girl's testimony about her father and the changing of a heart softened by her words. So please join me as we light our peace candle this morning. Please follow the litany in your bulletin. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, your word calling us to be peacemakers. Today we light this candle as a reminder of our calling. Join me in the prayer of confession as printed in the bulletin. We'll read this in unison. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our readers as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be light in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Our scripture today is from three Old Testament passages. I will read it. Uh, from the New Revised Standard Version, and then Beth will read it in Spanish. Exodus 16, verses 11 to 13. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. From Numbers chapter 11, verses 18 to 23, again God said to Moses, And say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wailed in the hearing of the Lord, saying, if only we had meat to eat, surely it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not only one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you. 
and had wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, The people I am with number 600,000 on foot. And you say, I will give them meat that they may eat for a whole month? Are there enough flocks and herds to slaughter for them? Are there enough fish in the sea to catch for them? The Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. And then from Psalm 105, verses 39 to 42. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quails and gave them food from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. Buenos días, yo estoy leyendo Éxodo 16, versos 11 a 13. El Señor habló con Moisés y le dijo, Ha llegado a mi o mis oídos las murmuraciones de los israelitas. Diles que antes de que caiga la noche comerán carne y que mañana por la mañana se apartarán de pan. Así sabrán que yo soy el Señor su Dios. Esa misma tarde, el campamento se llenó de codornices y por la mañana una capa de rocío rodeaba el campamento. Y otra de Números 11, 18 a 23. Al pueblo solo le dirás lo siguiente, santifíquense para mañana, pues van a comer carne. Ustedes lloraron ante el Señor y le dijeron, ¿Quién nos diera carne? En Egipto la pasamos mejor. Pues bien, el Señor les dará carne y tendrán que comérsela. No la comerán un solo día, día ni dos, ni cinco, ni diez, ni veinte, sino todo un mes, hasta que les salga por las narices y les provoque náuseas. Y esto por haber despreciado al Señor que está en medio de ustedes y por haberlo llorado, diciendo, ¿Por qué tuvimos que salir de Egipto? Moisés replicó, Me encuentro en medio de un ejército de 600 mil hombres y tú hablas de darías carne todo un mes aunque se les degollaran rebaños y manadas completas, les alcanzaría, y aunque se les pescaran todos los pe peces del mar, ¿eso les bastaría? El Señor le respondió a Moisés, ¿Acaso el poder del Señor es limitado? Pues ahora verás si te cumplo o no mi palabra. Este es la palabra de Dios. Gracias a Dios. The last few times that um, our family went to Shipshawana, Indiana, we got in the rhythm or the habit of taking the boys to a uh, candy store there and letting them choose one piece of candy each. Uh, that they could enjoy while we continued walking around. The last time that we went, Asher got up the courage uh, to pick out what's called bean boozled jelly beans. Some of you may have, have heard of these. There's a caution on top that says, caution contains weird and wild flavors. So this is how it works. On the back, it has a little chart, and there's basically two types of each kind of jelly bean in this package. One of them tastes good, one of them tastes horrible, and you don't know which one is which, and they look the same. So for instance, this jelly bean here, this white one, may be buttered popcorn, which for some people might be a nice flavor, uh, but you also might get rotten egg. You just, you don't know what it's gonna be. Uh, some other ones would be 
juicy pear on a green one, or booger. Or perhaps uh, what Asher and I got when we first tried it, birthday cake or dirty dishwater. Now, you might wonder why people would want to buy that. Um, it's just a novelty, it's really interesting. And surprisingly, they taste about as disgusting as you would imagine these things to, to taste. Uh, so it was, I'm sure, a funny sight when our family, including my in-laws, were sort of huddled around a trash can in Shipshawana tasting some of these jelly beans and having to, to spit many of them out uh, because of the disgusting flavor. Which made us think, who did the taste testing on this? Uh, did somebody actually sit there with dirty dishwater and then pop a jelly bean? And, oh, it needs a little more dirty sock flavor. I, I, I don't know how that went, but anyway, they exist. If you're interested in trying one, uh, let me know. We, thought about maybe putting out a bowl for the youth and not letting them know what, what's, uh, what's in it, but just kidding, you have to try that on you guys. So anyway, I couldn't, I couldn't not think of these jelly beans this week as I was sort of preparing and thinking through the message of today's text, when thinking about the quail in scripture and what it represents. Because just like these jelly beans that look the same but taste dramatically different, it seems like these two passages, both from Exodus and Numbers, talking about the quail and what they symbolize for the children of Israel, look the same in many ways, but yet taste incredibly different in the end. Some scholars have even wondered, like, is this actually the same account, trying to say the same story in two different ways, and what is trying to be emphasized in, in each side of the story? Is the quail, this is what Debbie Blue asks, is the quail a gift or a curse? Provision or a judgment? History itself seems a little bit ambivalent about this. In Debbie Blue's book that we've been using for this series, Consider the Birds, she goes through and cites various ancient sources on quail. Some of them were positive and some of them were negative. For instance, one source noted how deadly they could be in numbers, Pliny wrote about stories of quails who uh, flying over the Mediterranean Sea and uh, other bodies of water. And because quail are more of a, a ground fowl, they, they roost on ground. Uh, they can fly, but not as well as like pigeons and eagles. So when they cross a body of water, they often wait for wind to blow them, or they have to find places to, to rest in between because they don't have the stamina of some of these other birds. And so he recorded stories of um, people off the coast of Italy in smaller boats having their boat uh, basically overrun by a flock of quail needing to rest on their journey across the water. And some of them actually were so burdened by the weight of these quails that they sank. Now it sounds a bit dramatic, but somebody noted that this could actually be true given how small some of the boats were at this time and the number of quail that could come and land on the boat. So they can be deadly in numbers. But they can also be medically helpful. At least this is what some people thought. For instance, Pseudo Galen, in his medieval pharmacology, wrote that if a cruel person, a mean person, eats from the heart of this bird, he or she becomes friendly because its heart turned his or her cruelty into friendliness. I wish that that were true, right? You invite your, your enemy or that person that's been mean to you over for a soup and you maybe crush up a little bit of quail heart in there and all of a sudden they're crying from then on. I wish that that were true. Maybe it is. I'll have to try that sometime. But they also, she also notes that these could be, quail could be good signs in some cultures. For instance, in Lithuania, I don't know if this is still true or if this was historically, but in Lithuania, newly married couples would eat quail for good luck in marriage. Or in France, this is probably an ancient custom, the bride and the groom would carry quail hearts to ensure happiness in life together. But in other cultures, they actually represented trouble. For instance, in Madagascar, quail are considered taboo. In Hungary, they're considered an accursed bird. Uh, in ancient pharmacopoeia, uh, it is actually recorded that some thought quail were transformed frogs who had eaten gourds. I don't know, sometimes, if you look at a quail, I suppose the shape of its sort of rounded belly and then the, the work of its neck, I don't know, maybe you could see a, a gourd stuck in there, but yeah, quail transform from frogs from eating gourds, or that they could change into rats. So when looking at that history, it's not hard to see why Debbie Blue would note 
It's no wonder the Bible is a little ambivalent about what the quail means. History itself doesn't seem to know what to tell us. So let's look at the biblical text, this Exodus passage and this Numbers passage. We're going to look at some of the similarities between the two and then look at what some of the striking differences are to help us move forward. So first of all, in both passages, we have the Israelites grumbling to both Moses and then ultimately to God. Now, it's easy for us to read the Old Testament, especially these passages about the Israelites, uh, and not want to see ourselves in them. But the whole point of reading these passages is that we need to see ourselves in the Israelites in order to reap the blessings and the benefits of what they experienced. So let's start with that. What's particularly humbling as we consider ourselves or look at ourselves through the lens of Israel is that the Israelites, before this grumbling, had just witnessed God's miracles and judgment in Egypt. This was very soon after leaving Egypt, which somebody noted that contrary to what Woody Allen said, Woody Allen was famed in saying, I believe in God, if only God would give me a clear sign, like making a large deposit in my name in a Swiss bank. We often think that if God would just do that, I would, I would believe in God. Responding to this, Dennis Crowder, uh, Old Testament thoughtful theologian, says, Despite what almost all of us may think, miracles do not necessarily lead to faith. Despite what almost all of us may think, miracles do not necessarily lead to faith. Which maybe is why... Jesus does not point to the miraculous. Jesus doesn't point to the plagues or the Red Sea or to Jericho when encouraging us in the New Testament not to be anxious. He doesn't say, ah, consider the walls of Jericho and how they crumble after seven days with just the blowing of a horn. Or consider the Red Sea, how it was parted before the Israelites. The God who did this, how much more can that God feed you? No, Jesus says, when encouraging us not to be anxious, Consider the birds. Consider the lilies of the field. Not because there's some sort of miraculous provision coming to them every day, but rather that God, through the creative order, continues to feed them and provide care for them through how the creation works and operates. Consider them. And in this, we're reminded that God provides much more in the mundane, what we would think of as mundane, than in the miracle. Terence Freitag, another Old Testament theologian, says this, that the worship life of the people of God is not simply to focus on the dramatic acts or the miraculous things of God, but also to provide remembrances of how the seemingly little things in their daily lives are undergirded by the sustaining care of God. So our worship lives are supposed to be not just focused on the dramatic acts of God, but rather on sort of the mundane little things that God is continually doing to show us care and provision. So that's the first thing, is that in both passages, there's grumbling before God. The second is this, that not only do the Israelites grumble, but the, the reason for their grumbling, or their rationale for it, is that they're actually hungering or craving or yearning for their slavery, their time back in Egypt. If only we had died in Egypt, they said. We used to sit around meat pots and eat all we wanted. We used to eat fish without cost, melons and leeks and onions and garlic. I like how the Numbers passage is very specific about the things they're sort of fantasizing about in Egypt. Melons and leeks and onions and garlic. They're fantasizing over their cuisine in captivity. I think Debbie Blue rightfully notes, maybe the problem here is not so much that they desire too much, but that they are remembering wrong. Really, in Egypt, did they feed you that well? Forcing you to do slave labor for a generation upon generation. Was it really that good? Perhaps this is why the writer of Ecclesiastes says this. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Or again, Freitag says, the idealized and unwarranted memories of Pharaoh's food were to be replaced with the genuine memories of God's bread. Again, the idealized and unwarranted memories of Pharaoh's food, which were false memories, were to be replaced with the genuine memories of bread from God. So 
So those are our two, two preliminary things. First, the Israelites grumble in both passages. Second, the Israelites grumble because they're yearning for their time in Egypt. And then third, God provides quail and manna in both passages. The word, interestingly, in Hebrew for quail, selah or selah, literally means fat, the fat ones. Um, this isn't probably quite as big as a, a real quail, but you can see there's a little little puffy chest here on the, the quail, and they are a rather uh, plump little brown bird. Uh, so they've been used throughout history, uh, considered a delicacy, especially for their, their breast meat. Um, and so for the quail to be provided to, to Israel, this would have been uh, a delicacy to them, um, something, something beyond the generosity of the mere manna. This is what was provided. So we have these three things. We have the grumbling, we have the hungering or the remembering wrongly, we have the providing, and these are the same things in each of the passages. But here's where the accounts get different. Here's the major difference. In Exodus, Israel is given what they requested in moderation. So in, in the Exodus account, interestingly, the quail and the manna are given at the same time. It says that the, the quail would come in the evening and that the manna would come in the morning. And so evening and morning sounds a lot like the creation account, right? Evening and morning the first day, evening and morning the second day. There's some sort of this, this rhythm of creation that these things are going to be coming in. And if they tried to gather too much, there was like this built-in mechanism somehow that they weren't able to do that. There was, there was sort of no ability to have excess of this stuff. There was built-in moderation. But not only was there built-in moderation, there was also instruction to gather in moderation. So it said, God commanded them, gather what you need, just what you need. One omer, which would basically be like three pounds per person. So that's how it is in Exodus. In Numbers, Israel is given what they requested in excess. It says when the quail blew in from the sea, and it was the wind from God that somehow blew the, the quail in, which we learn sort of historically and in terms of birds, that's a very common thing for quail to be carried on the wind. It says they came in, this is probably an exaggeration, but this is how it's described, came in one cubit or three feet deep as far as a day's walk in any direction. So three feet deep as far as a day's walk in any direction. Granted, if there was three feet of quail around, you probably couldn't walk very far in a day, so maybe it wasn't really that, that big of a span. So I don't know, but three feet deep as far as you can walk in any direction. So there's excess. It's not this creational rhythm of exodus. And there's no instruction in numbers on how they are to gather. And so their response to this excess of quail is to gather in excess. And it says specifically that they gathered all day and all night and all the next day. And it says that no one gathered less than 10 homers. Again, this could be an exaggeration, but they think that 10 homers was approximately one and three quarter ton of quail. One and three quarters ton of quail. And no one gathered less than that. And then they spread them around the camp. Can you get a visual on this of quail, dead quail, probably salted and trying to dry in the sunlight, just spread across the camp? And this is the difference between these two texts. That in Exodus, moderation is a gift from God. Moderation is part of the gift that came from God. And when Israel practiced this moderation, they received that gift and its blessing. It became a provision in that sense. In Numbers, excess is the distortion of God's creative gift. And to practice that excess literally led to them receiving a sort of curse or a plague because of that excess. Now, it's easy to read those passages, and often it's described in the Old Testament as if 
they do this thing and then God sort of uh, miraculously intervenes and either judges them with something or blesses them with something. Uh, but ultimately, it seems like what those passages are trying to get us to understand is that those things themselves are actually, in and of themselves, the blessing and the curse. The moderation itself is the blessing. The excess itself is the curse, is the plague, and it's to remind them of Egypt. And what's really striking is that in Exodus, moderation is connected to Sabbath and rest. That passage in Exodus is the first passage we read about or hear about Sabbath in the whole Old Testament. This is before the Ten Commandments have given us the command to uh, practice or keep the Sabbath holy. This is the first time that we hear about Sabbath, and it's in connection to moderation and the rhythms of God in creation. Because God practices Sabbath, we should practice Sabbath as well. It is a gift. And in Numbers, excess is connected to slavery. The plagues of Egypt. It's disconnected from the creative rhythms of God. It's connected to slavery in Egypt and ultimately to death. This is the difference. Have you ever felt this in your own life? I must say now, as a, a homeowner, there are many blessings in owning a home. I love being able to work on the house and do things that you want to the house and take care of the yard as you please, and all these wonderful things. But there's also this element in it to where if you don't keep it in check, or at least this is my own personality, I can't project this on everyone else, uh, if you don't keep it in check, that yearning to care for your home, or make it better, or do all these projects on it, uh, it can quickly become a kind of compulsive slavery. Like I've, I've felt that. Maybe it was COVID season because we didn't have much else to do, and so home projects seemed like the thing to do, but I've been doing all sorts of home projects, and I started to get into this rhythm where uh, before I even finished one project, I was thinking of getting ready for the next one, and I wouldn't even kind of pause to enjoy what I had done before, before I just dove into the next project. And, and after a while, it literally started to feel like the metaphor of slavery literally felt like what was kind of happening in my own heart and in my own life. And so one night I remember going out into the garage and just having to sort of verbally, at least in my head, sort of offer this prayer to God of saying something to the effect of, like, God, this is our home. Like, of course, we, we love this. And I put a lot of sort of sweat equity into this home. Um, but I want to be at the place where if you ask us tomorrow for whatever reason to just sell it and get rid of it, and do something else with our lives, here in Elkhart or wherever it would be, um, please give me the strength to be able to do that because I can feel it sort of building an attachment inside of me. Maybe you've never experienced something like that, but that's, that's been my experience. Um, and sometimes we have to get to that place where we can say to God, God, this, this is yours. Um, do with it as you please. So is the quail, in the end, a gift or a curse, provision or judgment? Well, I think it's very clear in these passages that it is both. When received in creative moderation, when received in the rhythms of work and rest, the quail was a gift and the quail was a blessing. But when sought from excessive craving, and this is something I didn't mention. One of the differences between the two accounts is in Exodus, the quail and the manna kind of come at the same time as a request of the people for food. Uh, in Numbers, it seems as though they've already had the manna for a long time, and they've been getting sick of it. And so the request was for more food, desiring something else besides what God had already provided. So when sought from excessive craving, or when gathered in sort of restless, slave-like work, night and day, day and night, it becomes a curse and a plague and a return to captivity. So one is the way to receive God's provision, like to practice moderation is literally to receive the provision of God. And the other is ironically to reject God's provision, even though it looks like you're gathering it up in excess. It's actually a rejection of God's provision. 
And though we can't go into it, I wish we could, could do a whole other sermon series on how Jesus then becomes the embodiment of this way of receiving God's blessing. George MacDonald, I was struck by one of his quotes, said this, Jesus Christ is the way out and the way in from every slavery, conscious or unconscious, into liberty. Jesus is the way from the unholiness of things to the home that we desire but do not know. And Jesus is the way from the stormy skirts of the Father's garments to the peace of his bosom. This is what we see in the contrast of these passages in Exodus and Numbers. This is what we see in the contrast in our own lives as we learn to practice or not practice the gift of God of moderation in receiving God's provision. So I pray, brothers and sisters, that you, uh, along with me, and I pray that you would pray for me as well, that we could truly receive God's loving provision through his creation and accepting it in moderation and knowing that ultimately God is the ultimate gift that we can receive. Amen. Our response hymn is Haste and See, uh, Join Us on the Refrain, which is printed above. so good to me. without money and without pay. 
Why spend your money on that which is not food and your labor on that which does not satisfy? Come, come to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. God, may, may we come to you when we are hungry and we are thirsty and may we delight in the richest affair. Amen. Walk along as we sing of the mercies of the Lord. Spirit to guide you. Go now with hope, waiting for the fullness of Christ's reign. Go now with love, resting in God's care and the care of God's people. Go out with joy to listen and speak, to sing and suffer, to proclaim good news and give glory to God. Stay safe and go in peace. Amen. Thank you.